This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014, an interview with Eric Bishke, Chief Scientist and VP of Playlists at Pandora. DMT's coverage of South by Southwest is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by Music Graph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, Eric Bishke, Chief Scientist and VP of Playlists at Pandora. So hi Eric and thank thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. And so uh, I want to talk about the, you know, the history of the company's genome project uh, first. So uh, tell me a little bit about, about when you joined the company and how, how it all got started. Yeah, so I joined Pandora in uh, March of 2000. So I've been there 14 years. Um, Started by three people. Uh, most people know Tim Westergren, our founder. Yeah. Um, also, two other founders, a guy named Will Glazer. Uh, he was our CTO, sort of brainiac guy, and John Kraft, our original CEO. Um, back then, the thing they were pitching was this music genome project. Um, basically, for the last 14 years, we've had a team of 25 musicians and musicologists um, listening to tracks one yeah. at a time. Um, <laughs> And they listen to tracks one at a time, and they basically want to capture like the essence of every song. So sure. they literally kind of just go through every imaginable musical characteristic in a song, and they quantify it. So they sort of create this mathematic vector that represents every every track that yeah. we listen to. Yeah, and, and so that must that must have been quite a challenge back then because uh, uh, you know there wasn't anybody else doing that kind of thing. And so the, it, it, even just creating the database around the metadata and how do you tag songs and what kind of feelings do you assign to them must have been a, a pretty tough job. Yeah, it was a uh, it was super tough, and um, no one else was doing it. I look back and I think we were basically we wanted big data for music before big data was a word. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And serendipitously, it wound up being something you could build a really fantastic online radio service. Yeah. Um, but at the time, we just wanted to capture music data yeah. um, and just sort of expand sort of computers' understanding of, of music one track. Yeah, one track at a time. Sure, and, and the, the, the company has changed a lot also uh, due to the advancements in technology and the way that people consume music. You know, back when you started, there was no way that people were going to stream music from their phones. And so, uh, you know, what, how has that changed uh, the way that you serve music to, to, your, to your customers? Yeah, so the, the company I joined in 2000, the, the idea they actually pitched me on was um, uh, burning custom CDs, custom mixtapes in record stores, right. which now seems ridiculous. But I was like, this is a great idea. You'd walk into a record store, uh, you'd you know, use a kiosk or something to pick some tracks and you'd, and you'd burn a CD. Yeah. Um, within a few months after that, like every Dell computer in the world shipped with a, a CD burner in it. So that was a little dead in the water. We tried a <laughs> bunch of different um, business models before in like 2004, um, Joe Kennedy, our CEO at the time, basically kind of pitched the idea of online radio and that kind of cha changed everything for yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, how important it is to uh, really gain trust of uh, your listeners to deliver them the best possible experience. And so uh, how, do you, how do you get to that point where people trust you to give them the best music possible? Yeah, you, you get to that point by just day in, day out, every time they use your service, playing them good music. Yeah. Um, and then I think another important part of that is when a listener gives you feedback about something they don't like, to respect it, to just to listen and be like, all right, we tried this track for them, we thought you were going to love it, you yeah. didn't, that's okay, but we truly take it into account and sort of adjust the, the music going forward. And that's really how kind of Pandora gains people's trust. It's yeah. just like listen to people, respect their personal music beliefs and wishes, um, and you deliver that for, for years and people trust, yeah. trust you. And so uh, how, how do you feel about, uh, you know, over the years, you must have come to certain points where you're thinking, oh, maybe we should uh, integrate, you know, Last.fm data or, you know, uh, uh, other companies data, but you stuck to your guns and, you, you, you know, you, you own pretty much all your, your, your own data. So how has that perspective uh, stuck and developed? Yeah, well, um, it's easy in retrospect to see that it was the right decision. Yeah. Um, probably wasn't clear the entire time that was the right thing for us. But yeah. from where we sit now, 
you know, we've got more than 70 million listeners every month. Um, more than 250 million people have registered on Pandora to date. And pe- that's a lot of data. It's yeah. a lot of data. In the U.S., you know, no one else comes close in terms of having that amount of, you know, personalized radio listening yeah. data. Um, and it's sort of the crown jewels at Pandora because everything we do can sort of use this gargantuan pool yeah. of data to play the right music, both for everybody already listening, but everybody in the future who will listen. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, at this point we just, you know, we've doubled down on that. Um, we and protect it. We use it to make the music better. Absolutely. And it's interesting, actually, because, you know, that, that's a key part of the company's IP, I guess. And, uh, yeah. and so you, you have no interest at this point of making that data available through APIs or anything like that. That's your own proprietary data. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the academic in me would love to sort of open up, yeah. in particular, probably not the listener data, but the, the music genome project data. Um, it's tricky. It's hard to do. We've got, at Pandora, we basically have two major sort of pools of IP. Uh, the first is the music genome project, which we talked about. So, like, huge amount of pure musicological data. Yeah. And then the other bit is listening data. Sure. Um, both very effective. Both we protect them. Um, don't want to give it up to anybody else. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And so uh, the company made the very conscious decision to limit the amount of tracks that are on the service. So I think you're now uh, just uh, above a million tracks or so. Uh, and so uh, how, how did you come to that decision? And uh, how has that affected the experience of your users? Do you ever get complaints that you don't have enough catalog? Or uh, on the contrary, do you feel like your users uh, are better served by having a, a smaller catalog? Yeah. So um, Pandora's collection is absolutely intentional every track we play has been hand selected because we believe it adds to the value of what people hear um and paydor is very different than a lot of people a lot of other companies that were often sort of people put us up as like kind of like a competitor yeah uh we've got more than a million tracks on pandora that is enough music for every person on the planet to hear a completely personalized non-repeating stream of music for their entire lives yeah um so in no way are we really constrained um, in that dimension. But the particular thing that we're doing is the music we want on Pandora is the perfect, the perfect music, but specifically for online personalized radio listening. And it's right. very different than like an on-demand service, um, you know, where you want people to be able to listen to strange karaoke mixes <laughs> yeah. live from some old music festival like exactly, yeah. that might be a cool thing to do but on Pandora you want just a few key recordings of every track so you can play the perfect one for each person absolutely um, yeah. and so you're talking about uh, the, the user data and also you started to you, know, you, you are also using that user data to inform the experience of Pandora and to uh, sort of uh, starting to influence the way that the, the genome project also also delivers uh, the, the, the curation to your, to your users. So uh, how, how do you s- switch that dial from you know, uh, leaning more towards what's already been curated to leaning more towards uh, uh, you know, the feedback that you get from your users? Well, what's the optimum, uh, optimum uh, calibration there? Yeah, so sort of the the premise when you first turn into pandora we have a few basic pieces of information about you you give us when you register on pandora you give us your birth year your gender your zip code um and then you'll type in the name of your favorite artist or comic or track um those pieces of information are pretty good to sort of play a personalized stream of music forever sure um but as you listen and you give us feedback you thumb tracks up when you like them, you thumb down tracks when you don't like them, you know, you skip, you listen at certain times of the day, you listen on different devices, all of everything you do and interact with Pandora sort of lets us personalize the stream of music for you better. Yeah. Um, And the more you listen, the better it gets. So the more you interact with Pandora, the more you tune in, the better it learns you and what you like. Yeah. Um, and so do you also have like a vertical thing where, you know, for example, if I'm a, a 40-something that likes a two or three bands that are similar to this other 40-something that in the same demographic bracket, are you able to sort of uh, uh, predict what people are, are, are going to like based on, on that type of data as well? Yeah, there's, there's some of that for sure. Um, the, the tricky part is figuring out when that's the best algorithmic approach to take for you yeah. and when your tastes really do vary and are unique. And uh, our algorithms basically predict that, detect that. When when are you 
when could we stereotype you like everybody in your demographic and when can't we when yeah. when are your tastes truly unique and do we need to personalize in that dimension um and that's that's sort of the Pandora magic. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Pandora is one of the companies that has the most uh, integration with uh, uh, cars. Uh, so you, you are in a, you know, a bunch of different uh, brands and, and vehicles. And that also gives you a very interesting amount of, of data as to how people listen to music in the car. So how does that differ to usage on mobile, for example, or in the home? And uh, yeah. are you able to tailor make the experience of your users based on what device they are, they are listening on? Yeah, absolutely. All of the, all of the above. We, we're in more than 130... Um, different makes of car today. So if you go buy a new car in the US, like about, I think it's like more than half or more than two thirds, like wow. off the lot have Pandora integrated in them. Um, listening in cars is very different. At the moment on Pandora, it's like more than 80% of listening is on mobile devices. Yeah. Um, historically, like if you look at all music listening in the US, um, it's about 80% of it is happening in cars. And so that that is the future. At some point, like every car is connected. It's got Pandora in it. That's where most people are listening. Um, we're at the sort of like the early phases of, of digital cars with apps in them. Like yeah. we're used to having in our phones. Um, but the way people interact in the car is, is different because your attention rightfully so is on driving. <laughs> yeah. Um, the signal you get is mostly are people tuning in or tuning out. Like yeah. if they're listening to your service, that's a positive signal. They, they're less likely to interact because their hands are literally on the wheel. Yeah. Um, totally appropriate. So the signal you get is very different on different devices. Yeah. Um, we noticed when we switched from... So you could like, for example, you know, test them a little bit more on a, on a mobile device or on a desktop experience with the tracks they might not necessarily like or that are new for, to them than in the car where you might, may serve them a little bit more familiar catalog, right? Yeah, different device by device, they all... Um, people listening on them tend to enjoy di slightly different music experiences like you mentioned. People listening yeah. on a desktop um, or in the home like tend to like uh, more risky choices yeah. in their music. People in cars or while they're working um, want a little more uh, familiar music. They don't yeah. want things to sort of interrupt them. Sure. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun data to look at. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, we talked about the user experience on the music front, but uh, of course, uh, the amount of data that you have uh, as a company also informs the type of advertising that you serve uh, on, on a, a geolocation basis, also on a user by user basis, demographics, and what kind of music they like, and all that kind of stuff. So, so that improves your uh, sort of likability from an advertiser perspective, but also from a user perspective, if you manage to serve them the, the, the correct adverts that are going to appeal to them. So, uh, how have you seen that approach? Above over the years, I'm sure that when you first started out, it was a bit of a more blanket approach. So you had a you know a bunch of adverts that went out to most of your users. Yeah. But now I'm sure you have a much larger advertising catalog, and you can tailor tailor the, the yeah the the worlds of we've been in the business of play awesome music for people yeah for a long time. <laughs> um, we also serve ads, and I think over time the thing that's become very clear is that those worlds are two sides of the same coin. It's like the same technology you use to play awesome music for people is the exact same like predictive techniques you use to play the right ads for people. And they're, it's an integrated experience. So the perfect experience on Pandora is a, is a blend between the right sequencing of the perfect tracks yeah. and the right sequencing of the perfect ads. And, and those technologies are s totally intersected at this point, um, which is a really... It's a really neat place to be in. Um, very different than most other sort of uh, digital ad platforms. Yeah. Platforms, um, because it's very much audio based. It's like a very unique experience where we can kind of groom the entire experience over time with people between sort of the perfect mix. Yeah both on the music and the ad side. And the ad side, yeah, that's cool. And, and that, of course, that is also very appetizing to advertisers in terms of uh, buying inventory from you guys. Yeah, no, they love it. I mean, the other, the great thing about the position... Mobile has grown, like, massively. You know, you're one of the few companies that is truly monetizing mobile today, which is uh, Yeah, we're one impressive. of... I, I believe we're the uh, second biggest sort of um, mobile ad dollars platform in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, it's a really exciting place to be in. We we have so much data. The great thing we can do with advertisers is we can we can give them the data. We can run experiments where we can demonstrate exactly how much value we're creating for them. Yeah. Um, which makes it which makes it very easy. It's like a great yeah. place to be, and you just sort of tell people facts, and they wanna they want to run their advertising with you, which yeah. is which is great. 
This is awesome. Yes, sure. And uh, and so uh, you know, finally, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, you know the company as a whole. It's uh, it's huge, you know, in, in the U.S. Uh, you know, there is certainly still room to grow here, but of course, uh, people are are going to be wondering. You know, the, the definite room to grow is internationally because you have this great service. You yeah. set up the technology backend for it, and so you know, it's definitely something that would be rap replicable in in other territories uh, uh, if and when you decide to launch. So, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, we're already in Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Um, so we've we've begun to make sort of some stakes in yeah. some other inroads in some other countries. Um, it's pretty much just about licensing. The yeah. the licensing landscape in the U.S., Australia, New Zealand is very straightforward. Um, we would love to be in many territories, and it's really just it's just a matter of. You know, when can we get the licensing done? Yeah, exactly. um, sure. And I know, I know that the UK is a difficult market as well because uh, there's a lot of conversations now going around uh, rates and whether they should be lowered because a lot of services are not sustainable uh, back home. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that conversation evolves and uh, and maybe things will work out so that you can actually come come back to the UK at some point. <laughs> I, I would love to see that happen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Well, Arik, thanks so much for your time. It was a real pleasure. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.